So we've done healing, we've done um, exorcism. We're going to look at the resurrections of Jesus and uh, his own, as well as the return from the dead of, of other people, because we're trying to get the full meal deal. There, there aren't really, there are very seldom in God's work among human beings, one-off situations, um, like once upon a time, you know, like this only happens once. Uh, God is such a God of consistency, covenantal loyalty, continuity, connectedness, that, you know, he reveals his nature, kind of the way he rolls, and then he sticks with it so that we are able to recognize his hand um, and, ex and recognize that which is not his hand as well. So, the resurrection of Jesus, it's reported in all four of the Gospels. It gets just like a lot of coverage. The Gospel of Mark has been called a passion narrative with a long introduction. Because in reality, you get from, you know, like Mark 9 all the way through to the end of the book. Almost half of the Gospel of Mark has to do with the last week of Jesus' ministry. Um, his, uh, the passion week, we call it. So it is a dominant feature. This crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is a focal feature of the Gospels. And when you get into the book of Acts, these guys can't open their mouths without talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It doesn't make any difference whether in Acts, whether the uh, audience is, is Jewish or whether it's mixed or whether it's Gentile. It doesn't make any difference whether it's in Jerusalem or it's in Caesarea. It doesn't make any difference whether it's in Israel or it's out in the diaspora or Jewish communities, etc., living all through throughout the world. It makes no difference when one of these people in the book of Acts gives a sermon or a speech, they're going to talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I think it's a good argument then to be made that we should too. Our witness should include that death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. Sinfulness of man, forgiveness capable, possible in uh, in God's plan through the blood of Jesus. This is, these are important parts of the apostolic witness. If they're our template, if they're our exemplar, if, if they set the standard and we're supposed to be living into their reality to be as fruitful, as effective, then we probably need to be thinking about, okay, what did they focus on when they were speaking publicly or they were giving private witness, then how did they do it? It's a great question to ask, and I think the Bible answers it pretty, uh, pretty clearly. All over the book, uh, uh, the, uh, the New Testament, past the book of Acts, you get, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Basically, the whole chapter is about the resurrection of Jesus. And Paul even gives a long list because he's wanting to give his witnesses, the people who are eyewitness testifiers to this event, he gives a long list of witnesses, more than 500 people when you add them all up. It, what's interesting, though, is... The coming of a Messiah is not unique to the New Testament. It's out, already out there in, in Judaism. And, and when the Messiah comes, it, there's no real expectation that it, within the Judaism that Jesus came into, that this Messiah was going to rise from the dead. The reason I bring that up is, is simply this. The New Testament church had no need to make up a resurrection myth. It wasn't expected. So then why is this resurrection stuff, why is the New Testament eaten up with uh, discussions of references to the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead? I bet you can do the math. It's not because they needed to make it up. It's not because they made it up. It's because it actually happened. It's just simply an historical event. It's like, you know, yeah, to get the rest of this, to get the full story, you got to get this too. Well, why is that? Well, because it happened. Well, can you prove it? What did the first century church say to that? Yeah, we can prove it. We can prove it like we can prove anything else. Same thing we're doing in courts of law today. You bring in people who are eyewitnesses, exactly. And so there you are in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There's, there you are in the, um, uh, the four gospels at the end. You got all these people who are having these face-to-face -face experiences with the resurrected Jesus. 
put your hand, put your fingers in my wounds. Yeah? And then faith became sight for the guy that we call Doubting Thomas. All Thomas was saying, I'm a good Jew and I want proof. Where's the beef? You know, that if, if there's no video, it didn't happen. That's, that's what Thomas is saying. And what did Jesus do? He condescended to that. He, 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 he's fine. I'll meet you right where you are. Put your fingers in my wounds. Do you know he will do that with you as well? Jesus, I am in a trial. Jesus, I am struggling with some aspect of my relationship. Make yourself real to me. You think he'd honor that? Only if you held your mouth just right and you have the right Aramaic voice inflection. No, no. It's not the way God treats us. It's not, it's not part of our relationship with him. He doesn't play those kinds of games. People play games. God does not play games. So if, if you're there, and, and that's okay. You're not going to offend him. Just go ahead and say, make yourself real to me. And then open yourself up to however he's going to, going to do that. And it's going to be pretty, it's, it'll be a fun ride from that point on. Because he will make himself real to you. The Old Testament ends up with words like this in Malachi. Try me, prove me, put me to the test. And see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you that you can't contain. That sound like some good news right there at the end of the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament? That's the way that God rolls. Yes, go ahead and put me to the test. I'm a big boy. I've got broad shoulders. Bring it on, God says. And he is going to show himself to you. He will prove himself to you. Why? Because that's just what he does. All right, so what is the big deal about Jesus' resurrection? Well, there's at least one passage that spells it out so clearly that... Um, we don't have to go chasing answers anywhere else. Paul says that, that the resurrection of Jesus is of protos, Greek word. You know that word proton, right? Prototype, etc. It means the first. It means the primary, the basic, the foundational. Um, it is of foundational importance, Paul says, about this business of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And he says that if Jesus wasn't really raised from the dead, then we are of all people to be most pitied, that we've been, we, we're misrepresenting God if we say he did and he didn't, and we are still dead in our sins. We get all of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In other words, if this thing didn't really happen, if he didn't really come up, physically come up out of that grave, we're in a heap of trouble, son. So is this business of Jesus' resurrection, is that a knockoff? Is that a standalone? Is that a one-time only? Kind of unusual, sticks out like a sore thumb. Or is that something that's been a part of what God's been doing for a long, long time? Well, we hear about in Jesus' ministry. We're just going to go start with him and work our way backward. Taking the child by the hand, Jesus said in Hebrew, it's beautiful, Talita kumi, little girl, get up. And she did. So there's resurrection going on in Jesus' ministry. Now, I was taught in seminary, almost said cemetery. <laughs> I was taught in seminary, well, you have to use different language. Jesus' resurrection was unique. All other coming back to life, well, you use the word resuscitation. Can I tell you this? That's an English word, game play. play playing with words. Why is that? Because in the Greek of the New Testament, English isn't the divinely inspired language. Sorry to break it to you. Especially good old boys. Uh, but, but the Greek of the New Testament has words like egyro and anistomy. These words are words for to, to rise up or to come back to life or whatever. They're used of Jesus' resurrection and they are, all, and I cut that out because of time, so we're not going to be looking at that. But the Greek has these two words used of Jesus' resurrection and of other people's resurrection as well, like this girl or like Lazarus in John chapter 11. So the words in Greek are being used interchangeably. So I don't even bother with that. When God brings somebody back from the dead, that's a pretty cool day at the office. Whether it's Jesus or anybody else. 
So I'm, 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 my question, I'm, I'm asking you to engage this with me. Is Jesus coming back to life a one-time event? Is it a knockoff? Is, it's, a, it's a one event only and nothing else can, uh, can compare to it. And we are already seeing in the life of, in the ministry of Jesus, that this little girl is coming back to life. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, we hear about, we go past this, uh, th- this village right here. Uh, Nin is the Arabic name that is pres- preserved, the old um, name back in Jesus' day of this village called Nain or Nain, N-A-I-N. You know, we hear about the widow of Nain. You've heard the stories. You've been to Sunday school once or twice, right? So Jesus raises this young man, an only son, Uh, He came and touched the coffin. By the way, that would render him ritually impure. But instead of it rendering him ritually impure, it rendered that young man well and alive. That's the power and authority of of Jesus. And that's pretty cool, right? That's pretty neat. I could live with that. (laughs) This guy could too. You saw what I did with that. You saw what I did with that. Saturday morning before lunch. I love it. (laughs) I love it. Came up and touched the coffin and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, and there's that same word. It's used also of Jesus' resurrection in Greek. It's the same word. Arise. He is risen. So is he. Lazarus. Here's a picture of the tomb over in Bethany. Uh, Beit Ani in in Hebrew. Uh, In Arabic, they call it um, Elazaria. It preserves the name Lazarus. Elazaria, it's the place of Lazarus. This is the way that uh, Arabic-speaking uh, people have preserved this name even to today. So here it is, and when they open the door, you can go down a series of flight of steps, and you have to turn real hard and dog leg back underneath, you know, like flights of steps do today even, and you get down to the tomb of Lazarus, which is absolutely fascinating. Uh, wonderful uh, opportunity to connect um, place with text and, and, and reality that you can see with trust that we have, faith that we have uh, in our heart. This is a first century tomb. It goes back to the time of Jesus. It's in the place called El Azaria or Beit Ani, the same place where the Bible says this miracle took place. He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. I, I've, I can't tell you how many Pentecostal and charismatic speakers I have heard say about this. Well, it's a good thing Jesus said Lazarus because with his authority, if he had just said come forth, uh, everybody who'd ever died would have come up out of the graves. I have bad news for people who make those kinds of assertions and it's often just to get a rise out of a congregation, out of a group of people. And that is, you can't do this in English, but in Hebrew and Greek, there is a difference in terms of the form of the verb between the singular and the plural. Are you seeing where I'm going with this? And when he says, come out, he says it in the Yes. So even if the name had been left out, because again, it's not about the formula. It's not about getting a formula or a ritual or, you know, your, your, your Hebrew accent just perfect, you know, in order to make these, because it's not about you anyway, formula or otherwise. It's stuff is not about us. It's about God glorifying his name and extending his kingdom and meeting human need. The the need of people created in his image, who he loves. Goodness gracious, if we could just get get, get an idea of how much God loves us, number one. And number two, that it's not about us. It's not about us. It's never been about us. Oh, rats, I went to church and got bad news today. It's not about me. Well, you know what? The truth will set you free. It will set you free of that enslavement to self. I got to do it just right. I got to get the formula right. I got to get the method right. It's not that. So he came forth, all right? The one who died had come forth. Unbind him and let him go. To some people, he's still saying that right now. Got real quiet. Do you, do you realize that? He's, that's still a word for us. Let my 
Well, what about, okay, there's the ministry of Jesus. So we know it's not totally unique with, yeah, I know, but these are all related to Jesus, right? So we can kind of check that box and we can make excuses for that. But in the Hebrew Bible, we hear about Elijah. And you've heard this story probably before, but let's connect the two together. There was somebody dead, a, a dead child, and Elijah goes up and he stretches himself out on the child three times, okay? He just got arrested three times in the United States of America, okay? Uh, he called on Yahweh and he said, oh Yahweh, my God, I pray you, let this child's life return. The kid was officially dead. Death certificate and the whole thing. I'm just messing with you because there's apocrypha. I can do apocrypha too. All right, so, and the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the life of the child returned into him and he revived, he raised up. Second Kings, Elijah's successor, Elisha, okay, his student, um, a young boy that had been miraculously born through that prophet's ministry. He's out harvesting with his dad and he says, Father, my head, my head. It was probably something like sunstroke. Carry him to his mother. They took him to his mother and there she, he sat on her lap until noon and then he died. Done. It's over. Nail the coffin lid shut and walk away. No. She went up and laid him on the bed of the same prophet that had promised his miraculous birth. And she shut the door behind him and went out. Elisha came to the house and the lad was dead and had been laid on the bed. So he, listen to this, he entered and shut the door and prayed. You ever heard that language anywhere before? But when you pray to your father, pray to your father in secret. You go in and you shut the door and pray to your father. Jesus uses those same three verbs. I think that this is an ancient footnote saying, remember what God did for Elisha? God will do that for you too, remember? Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened. This is Jesus saying, Elisha's just a person like us. Jesus' brother, half-brother James, makes the same point about Elijah. Elijah was a man of like nature as we are, and yet when he prayed, God shut the heavens up. And when he prayed again, God turned it loose again. He's a person just like us. These person, people aren't super saints, they haven't gone through the, the saint, the, saint the, the beatification process. They're people that God calls. Are you called? All things work good, to, good to together, together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Yes, you are called. You might not be called to stand in, in, in front of this. I often wish that I was called to sit in a police cruiser or sit on a tractor and farm. That, that's my background. That's my family orientation. But um, and my dad's dream in life was to be an FBI agent. They disqualified him because he was an inch too short. It's like, what? That's, that's a sh smaller target to shoot at. I'd be, I'd be going for that, you know, and even turn sideways too. <laughs> he entered and shut the door and prayed to the Lord. Jesus incorporates that into his teaching on prayer in the Gospel of Matthew in the um, Sermon on the Mount. And he says, what Elisha did, yeah, go ahead and, go ahead and do that. Make it a matter of, of um, private prayer. Let God hear directly from your soul to his. And he laid on the child, put his mouth on his mouth and eyes on his eyes and hands on his hand. And this dude is definitely going to jail. Okay. He outdid his, his um, predecessor, Elijah, and stretched himself on him and the flesh of the child became warm. He walked around the house and did it again. And the lad sneezed seven times and opened up his eyes. Back from the dead, hallelujah. God is in the raising from the dead business. Okay, now I haven't made my passage to the other side. But I tell you what, when Jesus found me in a locker room in 1974, he raised me from the dead. Because I was in the process slowly, actually I think I was on fast forward, of killing myself. 
God raises us back and he gives us back the life that we take from ourselves and that the world sucks out of us and that the devil is trying to snuff out. Jesus is a giver of life. God is a giver of, he's always been that from Adam to us and all of this stuff going on in between. He is a giver of life. Death's going to be swallowed up in victory, you guys. You know that? He's, one day he's going to wipe away every tear from every eye. Have you put anybody in the ground lately? Thursday we buried my, my wife's dad. And we are still in mourning. And, and the Bible allows for that. Man, they, they mourned for 30 days for Aaron. It took a whole month to stop in the middle of the exodus from Egypt. They stopped for a month and mourned for Aaron. So we can stop for a little while and let God comfort and console the brokenhearted, right? Doesn't mean we're bad or don't have faith or we're, you know, not, act, not living out our faith properly. God himself allowed for that. In the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament, right? In the New Testament, they're making reference back to stuff like that. Women received back their dead by resurrection, that anistami, that, 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 that the same word used for Jesus' resurrection. I think that was something that they must have just made up in seminary. That, that resurrection, resuscitation thing. They had, had a real hang up about, well, God used to do that and now it's something different. That's not. He's the same. The book's the same. What he's called us to is the same. It doesn't even stop, though, with the death of Elisha. He's now dead, and he's buried. And they were taking another man out for burial, and behold, saw a marauding band, so they threw the body into Elisha's grave. They don't bury like we do. They bury in caves, and the caves are open, right? You can go back and you can visit the dead, and you can work on them like they did with Jesus. Went back three days later, and their plan was to work on the body some more, taking spices, etc., so, again, we can't click and drag from our world into the world of the Bible. Open cave, they threw this man in. This is real and normal in that world. Would be, like, completely unheard of in our world. Be against the law in our world. Everything's got to be sealed, you know, and, you know, done just, just right. All the I's dotted, all the T's crossed. Um, uh, but here, they throw the man in, and the man's dead body just happened to touch the, the, the bones, look at it, the bones of Elisha. What this means in that climate is that he'd been dead for a year at least. Otherwise, the bones would still be, the, the flesh would still be decaying. It touched the bones of Elisha. Elisha's been dead and gone for a year. And because of, it's not because of Elisha, it's not because of those bones. It's the power of God flowing through a, a yielded, empty, willing, obedient vessel. You get that? That's true for us too. It's, and it's not about us. Elisha, the real Elisha was gone. He was enjoying joy unspeakable and full of glory, right? But his bones, God worked the bones were evidently an agent of, that, that transmitted the power of God. And it says, this guy revived and stood on his feet. How about the prophetic word? That's some historical. I sometimes refer to them as the hysterical books. Um, but in the pr prophetic word we hear from Isaiah, your dead will live. Their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. The earth is going to give birth to its depart, depart, departed spirits. Is Isaiah looking forward to some great event of general resurrection? Yeah. So we got it in the 8th century B.C. We've got it in the 6th century B.C. Ezekiel has this dry bones vision. And God asks him, he sees this valley full of dead people's dry bones. And God says, son of man, can these bones live? And he says, I'm going to cause them to come to life. And I'm going to open up the graves of your people and cause them to come out of the grave. 
So now we get in the next generation and Ezekiel was at the beginning of the Babylonian exile around 587, 586. Daniel is now prophesying at the end of that 70 year period. So a whole generation or so, depending on how you mark generations has gone by, but look at the same message in Daniel and it's even more specific because that's the way that the Bible usually goes is God keeps on turning up the volume as we, um, as we go through history. His word becomes clearer. We see him more clearly. Finally, we see him in the flesh, in Jesus. God becoming enfleshed or incarnate. And so, yes, this is progressive revelation. This is normally what the Bible does. Did, Did Abraham know more about God than, say, Daniel? No. Did John the Baptist know more than, say, for example, um, Jacob, the, the, the patriarch, yes. So the more you go through biblical history, the clearer and clearer it gets, the more God's turning up the flame. Daniel, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, some to everlasting life, others to grace and everlasting contempt. Doesn't that sound basically New Testament to you? Daniel has a real clear idea that there's going to be a general revelation And there's going to be, ultimately, there's going to be a judgment. And some of them will experience eternal life and others will be experiencing the opposite of that between the Testaments. See what we're doing? We kind of talked about Jesus and we talked about the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. And now we're going to talk about between the Testaments, what connects those two dots. In the book of First Enoch, which is late 4th century B.C., The book of Enoch, late 4th century B.C., so 300 plus years before John the Baptist and Jesus are born. The Lord of Spirits is going to abide over them and that son of man, that's that's the messianic term, Ben Adam, son of man. They will eat and lie down and rise up forever and ever. The righteous and elect will have risen from the earth. This is that attitude in the, in the, between the Testaments, continuing to develop and progress after the end of the Old Testament. But pe- people keep thinking and they keep praying. They keep having relationship with God and God is moving the ball along and it's getting clearer and clearer and clearer that there's going to be, like there has been in the past, there's going to be a great general resurrection and this one's going to be associated with the coming of the Messiah whether first or second coming, it's not clear here, but we know it now because we have New Testament. The Lord of the Spirits is going to abide over them. He's going to raise them up. They're going to rise from the earth and they will be clothed with garments of glory. Sounds a little bit like the book of Revelation, doesn't it? Okay, we have a cue there. Somebody tell me what that means. Qumran. Decode that for me. Qumran means the... Yes, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So in a Dead Sea, one of the pieces of, uh, of 900 manuscripts that have been recovered from those 11 major caves, the, the heavens and the earth are going to listen to his Messiah, God's Messiah. What is he going to do? The poor, uh, he's, uh, he's going to pour his spirit out on the poor. He's going to free prisoners and give sight to the blind and straighten out the... T- Does this sound a lot like Isaiah 61 and the ministry of Jesus? Yes, it does. You don't get that kind of clarity in the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. But people keep thinking. They keep praying. God keeps working with them. So we're getting this in the second, third century BC. He's going to heal the badly wounded, line 11 or 12. He's going to heal the badly wounded and he will bring life to the dead. Pray, proclaim good news to the meek and the like. People are believing this and they're yearning for it. They're waiting earnestly for it. A couple of centuries before Jesus shows up. You think God honored that? Yeah, he did. You think people maybe when Jesus shows up, they're looking at, yeah, they're looking at Isaiah and they're looking at Daniel. They're looking at these things back in the days of Elijah and Elisha. And they're also continuing to think for themselves as free moral agents. There was somebody who said, I think, therefore I am. Anybody remember that? Who said that? Rene Descartes. But guess what? Rene Descartes got it from St. Augustine in the late 400s, early 500s AD. There is indeed 
Ein kol chadash tachat Hashemesh in, in the book of e- Ecclesiastes. There, that's not tongues, that's Hebrew. Um, <laughs> there's, there is nothing new under the sun. That's kind of the way God rolls. Why? So we can connect the dots. So he and his character remains consistent. I think we've been, that, that's a theme that's developed this morning, right? Yes. He's going to bring to life the dead and proclaim good news. In the book of 2 Maccabees, now this is in those 14 books that were included in the middle 1500s officially by the Roman Catholic Church, but this is intertestamental stuff. 1 Maccabees comes from about 105 BC. This man who's about to be martyred, and this is one of the reasons because people were being martyred during the Protestant Reformation. You may have read a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. Anybody? Yes? All right. So that was going on. Did they need encouragement? Yes. Martyrdom, it's all going on in First and Second Maccabees, especially in this part of Second Maccabees. This guy says, hey, I can handle this. I got these hands from heaven. If, they're gonna, if they want to cut them off to torture me to death, then that's okay because I'm going to get them back again. One cannot but help but choose to die and cherish the hope that God gives um, of being raised from the dead, raised again by him. But for you torturers, there will be no resurrection to eternal life. Another passage from 2 Maccabees is full of this. Chapter 14 as well. The creator of the world is going to, in his mercy, give life and breath back to you again. This encouragement to accept martyrdom and and to not deny God in the time of torture and death. Accept death so that I might get you back again with your brothers is the appeal that the mother of these brothers, again, seven brothers, is making to um, to her last son. Again in 2 Maccabees, Judah Maccabee acted, the the leader of the revolt against the Greeks, acted very well and honorably, taking into account the resurrection. You think these people just before the dawning of the New Testament era or time period, do you think they believed in bodily resurrection from the dead? That they were looking for that, they were expecting it. It was a part of their faith system that had been incorporated from times in the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, on into the intertestamental period. There's another story in chapter 14 mentioned of another martyr. His blood was, and by the way, this is mentioned in the uh, the, uh, works of Josephus as well. His blood now completely drained from him. He called upon the Lord of life and spirit to give them back to him again. In other words, help me remain faithful all the way through martyrdom and then restore me, restore my body to life with a real physical resurrection like we hear about in the New Testament Uh, regarding Jesus and this was the manner of his death in another book called uh, fourth Ezra or second Esdras the earth will restore those who are asleep it's not just in one or two books this is everywhere Josephus the Pharisees who are the teachers of the people they believe this that the souls are immortal and that we'll have an opportunity for resurrection. And these views have been persuasive with the population at large. We hear with the rabbis. We make mention when we pray in the benediction called the Shmonesre, we make, make mention of the resurrection of the dead. This is a consistent prayer prayed by observant Jews even to today, every day of their lives. Does that happen with us? Does this idea, this, one of these days I'm going to put off mortality and I'm going to put on immortality, is that a part of your daily prayer life? It, it is of orthodox, of observant Jews. I, I'm not trying to put you under a guilt trip or anything. I'm just saying this is, these components are realities that are a part of a daily vibrant faith that's going on in a faith community right now, today. All over the world, at different time zones, when they pray the Shemona Esrei, they're, they're talking about, I'm, I'm expecting, I'm looking forward to a day where there is a resurrection of the dead. It's a part of, it's a component of the belief system of every observant Jew, as demonstrated by its presence in their prayer life. Uh, 
Rabbi, uh, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Phineas ben Yair uh, says that saintliness leads to the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the gift of the Holy Spirit leads to the resurrection of the dead. He's talking about kind of time frames. Is, is people yearning for God and people living out a life of holiness. Well, that's going to result in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is going to be the precursor to the resurrection of the dead. In the, uh, also in the early rabbis, um, the people who will have no share in the world to come, well, these are the people who, uh, one of the things that they have problems with is they don't accept the resurrection of the dead. You know who this would be in Jesus' day? Go back to that Matthew 22 passage where those guys come to Jesus and they're saying, Master, there was a guy who married a woman and, and, and he died. And then all of his brothers, there's seven of them, they all died. So whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? You remember this conversation? And Jesus says, you're wrong because you don't know the power of God and you don't know the scriptures either. And he says that you don't give or you're not given in marriage in, 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 the, in the kingdom to come. And um, Paul says it like this, flesh and blood doesn't inherit the kingdom. But he says, we're going to be like the angels. You know, there's a popular teaching going around about I think it's based on Michael Heiser's book, Unseen Realm or something like that, where the reason why we have so many demon problems today is because um, uh, demonic spirits um, had sexual relations with human women and they bore the giants and the spirits of these departed giants, those are the demons. You don't find that in the Bible. The reason I mention it is because I was riding down the road just recently with my granddaughter. She said, Papa, in youth group, the guy was preaching and she told me what I just re reiterated to you. She says, do you believe that? And I said, no, ma'am, I don't. She said, why don't you believe that? I said, because it's not in the Bible. You get it in First Enoch, you get it in some Dead Sea Scrolls. Some of the early church fathers taught it. Some of the early rabbis taught it. Doesn't mean it's Bible. It doesn't conform to what we have in Scripture. Again, it's do you accept multiple sources of authority in your life or are you fully, have you fully embraced this idea of Protestantism, this identity of being fully Protestant that the Bible is my rule for matters of faith and practice? See how easily we can get off track? So God bless Michael Heiser and um, his book, I guess. Okay, maybe not, but God bless Michael Heiser. Um, but if the Bible doesn't go there, we don't have to. We're under no obligation to accept that. It doesn't make any difference how many copies that book is sold. It doesn't make any difference how popular it is. It doesn't make any difference how much money Michael Heiser has made. It's, does it conform to Scripture? If not, cast it down. Cast it down. The resurrection of the dead is prescribed in the Torah. Notice it says at the very bottom of that slide. And then um, how do we know that the Torah, the law of Moses, teaches the resurrection of the dead? This is some fascinating stuff. Well, it says that you've got to take a certain offering, the, the raise up offering, the wave offering, um, no pun intended, of the Lord to Aaron, um, the priest. Well, Aaron's dead. How do you do that? You can't do that. But that means that, the, that Aaron's destined to live in the future and that proves the resurrection of the dead. That's interesting proof texting, isn't it? And that's not totally unique. Um, Rabbi Simai says... Where do we get the resurrection of the dead in the Torah? Well, it's derived from the verse regarding the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan. But Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob never inherited the land of Canaan, right? It was only after the Exodus and the 12 tribes and these guys are pushing up daisies or whatever flowers are growing in the land of Israel. And so... Um, from this, you can get the resurrection of the dead. They will come to life and will inherit the land in the world to come. Interesting proof texting, right? Jesus had that, those Sadducees come and talk about the, the seven brothers that had the same wife and that kind of thing. They're like the angels in heaven. They're, they're not married in heaven. And he says, but regarding the resurrection of the dead, haven't you read what was spoken by God saying, I am, present tense, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but these guys continue to live, and God is still their God. 
That's some interesting in Bible interpretation too, but not a whole lot unlike the work of those rabbis that we read right before that. In other words, the people that Jesus is talking to can accept that kind of Bible interpretation. They've been hearing it from the time that they were knee-high to a grasshopper or whatever kind of aggravating insects they have in the land of Israel. So do intertestamental sources talk about this resurrection of Jesus? Is there anything other than the New Testament that describes this resurrection of Jesus? Josephus, remember who he is? First century Jew, living in the land of Israel, writing at the same time that the New Testament is being written down. He says that Pilate condemned Jesus to be crucified and to die. You ever read that before? Oh yeah. That's in the New Testament. But now it's also confirmed by a first century Jew living at the time that Jesus and the apostles did. And those that were his disciples did not stop being his disciples, but they reported that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. And Josephus never comes to faith in Jesus, but he says at this point, perhaps he was the Messiah about whom the prophets have recounted wonders. That's some interesting corroboration of New Testament realities right there. The Babylonian Talmud goes on, the rabbis say that Jesus was crucified on the eve of Passover. Why? Because that's the day of preparation when you slaughter the lamb. Then it gets dark and it's the next day according to Jewish timekeeping and it's the Passover day and that's when you consume the lamb and you have the Passover meal. Yes? That's some pretty accurate, cool stuff. And, but he was crucified. Why? Because he practiced magic. And he led Israel astray with his magical powers. You might, yeah, we know that you cast out demons, but you do it by the power of the dark side, by the power of Beelzebub. That charge is the same as, is as old as the New Testament. Jesus' contemporaries were saying, you're, not, you're doing this stuff and we recognize it's happening, but you're not doing it appropriately. So same charge here. Practice magic and use that, his miracle working power to lead Israel astray. Here it says, Rabbi Yochanan says he was a diviner. By the way, he's uh, connecting it to Jesus and Joseph and carpentry. Onkelos, somebody whose name we don't even know about, raised Jesus the Nazarene from the grave through necromancy, through dark magic. Are they admitting that he was raised from the dead? Survey says. Yes. Yes. He's saying it happened through illegitimate means, but they're saying, yeah, we know that Jesus was raised from the dead. This is an admission. It's a corroboration or confirmation of what we read in the four gospels, in the book of Acts, and in the letters and stuff all the way to the book of Revelation. This is my last slide, and then we might be able to take a question or two. In this whole section of the Talmud, in Sanhedrin 106, from the, the end of 105 to page 105, all the way through this section 106a, 106b, they're talking about Jesus. They're calling him different things. Sometimes they refer to him by name. Sometimes they'll call him Doeg, the Edomite. Uh, sometimes they will call him um, Balaam, the false prophet of the book of Numbers. Um, so they're using code words, but the way that they describe these people These are realities of Jesus' life, not the biblical Doeg, the Edomite, or Balaam, the false prophet. So they're using code words, and then they make this statement at the very end of this section. Woe to him who makes himself alive by the name of God. I had a conversation about the uh, proper name of God um, between sessions this morning, and the the name of God was being used in um, ritual formulas, incantations, and that sort of thing to remove demons and to perform cures and all kinds of things. But what they're saying is that Jesus was a practitioner of magic. They'll go even further. They'll say that Jesus learned this stuff in Egypt when Jesus as a child was in Egypt. And he came back to the land of Israel with all kinds of magical powers. And then he proclaimed himself to be God in the flesh. And they say that Jesus worked his miracles by, the, by illegitimate manipulation and use of this uh, divine name of God. 
that no one else was even uh, allowed to pronounce. Some kind of way Jesus had gotten this, uh, sneaked this power out of the temple in, in Jerusalem. And now they're saying that Yes, Jesus was resurrected from the dead and he even did it in this text. It says he did it himself, but he did it by the power of the dark side. Not appropriately. It's, an admit, it's the same thing that we get in the gospels. We know that you cast out demons, but you do it by the power of Beelzebub. You remember this, right? So it's the same old stuff. We can't deny that you work miracles, that you heal people, that you cast demons out of people. We can't deny that you were resurrected from the dead. Same thing that Josephus said, by the way. The only thing that we can do is we can say it was done by illegitimate means. Well, you know what? Because you guys are free moral agents, because you're members of the uh, citizens of the good old U.S. of A., you get to make your own decision. Was it the, by the power of the dark side or was it by the power of the father of lights that flowed through him and brought deliverance and brought healing and that brings resurrection? Hallelujah. 